So what we're going to talk about today is called combinatorics, which is basically a fancy word for talking about how many ways can we rearrange or count uh, certain objects. And so there are a few cases to look at that come up all the time in probability, and so let's go through them. First one is called k-tuples. And the idea here is that I have k slots, and I have a certain number of choices for each slot, and I want to know how many total possibilities are there. So the setup is, you know, I have k slots, and let's suppose I have n1 possibilities for the first slot, and n2 possibilities for the second slot, and so on, all the way to nk possibilities for the last slot. And so it looks pretty clear that how many total possibilities are there? Well, it's n1 times n2 times all the way up to nk. So one way of thinking about this is like with this product notation where I'm multiplying the number of possibilities for each slot altogether. And so for example, say I'm in New York State where the license plates have three letters and then four numbers. How many possible license plates are there? So I have three slots for letters and four slots for numbers. So there are 26 possibilities for each of these slots and 10 possibilities for each of these slots, and so the total number of possibilities I have is whatever this very large number turns out to be. And then I can turn this into a probability problem by asking, okay, so what's the probability that a license plate is of the form A blank blank one blank blank blank? Well, again, I solve this with a counting method. I say, okay, it's the number of desirable outcomes divided by the number of total outcomes. And so my desirable outcomes are of this form. And here this is like kind of a sub-problem where I say, okay, I have A is fixed, then I have 26 times 26 possibilities for those next two letters. The one is fixed, and then I have 10 times 10 times 10 possibilities for the other ones, and this is divided by the total number of possibilities for license plates that I have, and what's left over is 26 times 10, which is 1 over 260. Okay, so my probability of that form is 1 over 260. Okay, kind of related is to say, okay, uh, what's called um, ordered samples with replacement. So the situation here is saying, okay, I've got um, k slots, and for every slot I have to put an object in, but after I put the object in, I can choose it again. So it's like saying, okay, I have k slots, and I have n possibilities for this slot, and n possibilities for this slot. So basically it's like saying the previous thing where my choices per slot is the same for every slot. And so it's pretty clear that the number of of possible um, you know, sets I have is n to the k. So for example, this is like saying, okay, you have to choose a four character password and so that means that there are 26 possibilities for each slot and there are four slots. So this is how many possible really easy to break passwords that I have. Of course, in the real world, there are all these constraints on passwords, right? So the next thing that you might put a constraint on is to say, okay, after you choose something, you can't choose it again. So this is called ordered samples without replacement. So again, I'm choosing k objects um, in order from n possibilities, but you can't reuse objects. So it's like saying again, I have k slots, there are n choices at the first slot, but then there are only n minus 1 choices at the next slot, n minus 2, dot dot dot, all the way down to n minus k plus 
right? So this is like saying, okay, I've got the four character password with no replacement. So that means I have 26 choices for the first, 25 choices for the next letter, then 24, then 23. So this is actually a smaller number than when I had 26 choices at every slot, right? So this number, which is, you know, n times n minus 1 all the way to n minus k plus 1, there's a easier way to write this result, and that's by looking at factorial notation. So this is like saying I have n factorial over n minus k factorial. Remember that n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. And so that means that here n minus k factorial is like n minus k, n minus k minus 1, all the way down to 1. And so what happens is that this part kind of cancels out all the terms over here, and the last term I see over here is this one, which is exactly this number, right? So this is actually the easier way to, to write this, um, this big number. And usually, you know, these numbers are kind of hard to deal with when n and k are, are large. Okay, two more things. Next one is what's called permutations of objects. This is like saying, how many distinct ways are there to rearrange n objects? And so actually this is not that different than um, the previous thing, except it's like saying I have n objects and I have n slots to put them in. So I have n choices for the first slot, n minus 1 choices for the next one, n minus 2. By the time I already get down to the last slot, all my choices are used up and there's only one thing that I can put in there, right? And so this number is actually just n factorial. So there are n factorial distinct permutations of different objects. So for example, I could say, okay, you know, a, a car seats 4. This is my crude drawing of a car. And so there are, say I've got a family of four, how many ways are there to put those four people in the car? Well, there's four choices for the driver, three choices for the front side passenger, two choices behind the driver, and then the person who's left here is just four factorial, which is 24, okay? The last one is what's called sampling without replacement or ordering. And this is what happens when we don't care about the order of the objects in the set. We just care about what is contained inside the set. So um, sometimes you see this phrase in problems like, you know, how many ways to choose k out of n objects? I guess I should have good notation. And so um, sometimes you'll see this written like this with this kind of capital C with two super subscripts. Or you may see it written like this, N, K in this kind of parentheses. And you may hear it read, N choose K. Okay. So what is this number? Well, we already know that if I'm going to put, uh, you know, I have K slots and I'm going to put uh, choosing n, then n minus 1, and so on. That was the previous one. Now I'm like saying, okay, I don't care what the order of these things is. And so that means I've overcounted if I'm just using the permutation of objects. I have to divide by some number to account for all the kind of doubles or duplicates, right? So um, with ordering, we already know this is this answer, right? But you know, then I say, well, of this set of k objects, there are k factorial ways to rearrange those objects inside the set. So k factorial these are, you know, effectively the same set. They're duplicates. And so that means that this critical idea of n choose k is n factorial over n minus k factorial divided again by k factorial 
to account for all the doubles. Okay, and so for example, this is like saying, okay, I'm choosing three people for a team project out of ten. I don't care what the order that I chose them was in. So I could say, you know, um, ten people choose three. How many possible three-person teams could there be? Well, that's like ten choose three, which is 10 factorial over 7 factorial, 3 factorial. So if I just were to look at this part by itself, that's like 10 times 9 times 8. The 3 factorial part is 3 times 2 times 1. And so I can do some cancellations. And I can see that there are 120 such possibilities. Okay. A couple other examples. Um, I could say, OK, I've got a ball. Or I've got a bag, and the bag contains uh, two black balls and three white balls. And I want to know how many distinct permutations are these of, of balls. Say I'm drawing the balls out of the bag, and I'm putting them into slots. How many distinct black-white combinations are there? Okay. Well, since I can't tell the black balls apart or the white balls apart, there actually aren't that many combinations. And one way I think about this is to say, okay, two of these slots have to be the black balls, right? And so I can think about how many you know, ways are there to choose two of these five slots to put the black balls in. And so that's just five choose two, which is five times four times three times two times one over three times two times one, two times one. So I get lots of cancellations. And it turns out there are only 10 ways of doing this. And if you start to write them down, you can convince yourself that there really aren't that many. Last thing I'll do in this video is, uh, you know, a card problem. So let's say, um, you know, I choose two cards from the deck, normal deck of 52 cards with 13 cards in each suit. What is the probability that I get exactly two hearts? Okay. So Again, I don't care about the order of the cards or anything like that. So same idea. I have the number of desirable outcomes divided by the number of total outcomes. So how many total outcomes are there? Well, there's 52 cards, and I'm choosing five, right? So that's a big number. And then how many desirable outcomes are there? Well, it's like saying, I need to select exactly two hearts. There are 13 hearts in the deck, and there's 13 choose two ways of doing that. And then I to choose three other cards. So there are 39 non-hearts in the deck, and there are 39 choose three ways of getting those other cards. And so this is the total number of uh, possibilities with exactly two hearts divided by this. I'm not going to figure this out. This is like some huge number. You'll find that even looking at you know a number like this is is this is okay. This is cumbersome. This is like a huge pain. So you're going to deal with these massive numbers. And so if you're solving a real problem, usually you can just kind of leave these numbers as is, and I would not uh, penalize you on an exam. And so I'm going to do some more combinatorial problems uh, as exercises in the next video. So maybe I'll see you there.